Association of Information Technology Professionals is a non-profit organization that provides leadership and professional development opportunities to IT professionals. Our mission is to keep members informed of cutting edge trends and best practices in managing technology, as well as to provide strong networking opportunities. Our chapter membership provides many benefits, including uh, networking with community of IT professionals, uh, bringing experts in their field to share cutting edge ideas, bringing together people to foster innovation and build professional networks. We have regular meetings that help members stay up to date with the latest trends and best practices in managing technology. These meetings are a great opportunity to share ideas and encourage innovation, while also providing excellent networking opportunities. You can get more information on our website, aitp-la.org or email us to get more information uh, about the benefits and the membership at info at aitp-la.org. Just few logistics before the presentation. Uh, please mute your audio. We are recording this meeting, so if you don't want to be in the video recording, you can uh, you can turn off your video. Uh, feel free to chat with other attendees and submit questions. We'll be taking questions towards the end. So uh, you can put all your questions in the chat and one of us, uh, Roger or us, will be taking up those questions. This meeting is going to be posted on our AITP LA website uh, in next few days. So you can feel free to check the meeting uh, recording after that. At this point, I'm going to ask Roger Lux uh, to introduce our speaker, Peter Coffey, for today's presentation. Great, thank you. Well, uh, everyone's already kind of met Peter Coffey tonight. Um, we started having uh, inviting Peter uh, to give his annual forecast in the late 90s. Uh, it's after uh, I had attended a meeting of ACM and uh, we, I th believe we had uh, several meetings that were joint meetings uh, at that time. And then uh, it sort of evolves uh, after that. And he's been giving annual forecasts for something like 25 years. And every year is different. It's different information. He's an amazing person who just uh, covers a lot of territory and is uh, constantly uh, growing and uh, learning new things. So tonight, uh, his topic is once again different. Uh, the title is What's Worth Knowing? Uh, Repricing of Skills and Talents in this Epoch of AI. And he gave us one sentence to describe it. Uh, technology's impact on the worth of human talent and training has been envisioned for decades, but the conversation has taken on new intensity and immediacy in the months since generative AI became a part of daily life. So uh, a very short uh, bio for Peter Coffey. Uh, he has four decades of experience in AI applications and his global perspective as a writer, educator and, v educator and VP for strategic research at Salesforce will allow us to bring an, us an annual update on the trajectories of change in what we'll do and how we'll do it going forward. I'd like to introduce Peter Koch. Thank you, Roger. Um, I'm gonna have to ask you to release the screen. There you go. All right. There's some there's some platforms in which I can simply hijack the screen, but uh, but uh, Zoom is not so accommodating. Um, if anyone can confirm for me that you're seeing the Salesforce test pattern, then I will be able to proceed. Yes. I do Excellent. see that. Excellent, then let's get going. Um, what I wanna to talk tonight with you about is is a a three-part idea everyone wants to know about ai i hope i will share some perspectives on ai that are new to you and and help puncture some of the hype balloons as we discussed uh, before the recording began and to understand some of the really central questions about why is this not just the third of the so-called ai winters the cycles of hype and disappointment that that were named AI winter number one and number two for reasons I will be discussing. 
This word automation may be new to you and I'll be describing it in some depth. It comes from uh, phrasing and uh, ideas that were introduced by IBM in the early 2000s about building systems that have greater resilience, greater ability to analyze their own behavior and to be self-healing and self-correcting. And then of course, the, the last word here in this title of anticipation is the so what? What does this mean for me as a professional and a practitioner? What does this mean for my organization? How do I need to be an effective change leader for my organization? And not incidentally, what kinds of conversations do we need to have with the next generation about, as was, was said in the uh, uh, publicity for this event, what's worth knowing? So let's talk about it. Let me start with this first question, which is really important to us at Salesforce and to those in many companies, which is why is AI able today to transition from being a research topic or a technology initiative to being something that we can really start discussing in a more pragmatic context of simply, you know, what's going to be the, re the return on my investment here? What, what should I ex ex expect to be um, obtaining? And not just, you know, when, when do the promises turn into something remotely resembling reality? The phrase AI really is generally considered to date back to 1955 with the so-called Dartmouth memo uh, written by some pretty smart people in which they severely underestimated most aspects of the challenge. They actually talked about doing something in two months with 10 people. They did say a 10 man study. I don't think we would use that phrase today and said, we think a significant advance can be made if we work on it together for a summer. Okay, maybe a little bit of hubris there, but the phrase in the middle, on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. This turned out to be a breathtakingly naive understanding of what intelligence actually is as we apply it in, in our own daily lives with the, with the wetware uh, between our ears. The things that many people find difficult, calculation, rigorous deduction, pattern matching, and so on, were assumed to be the things that needed to be encoded and, and made possible for machines to do. But the most difficult aspects of being a functioning human intelligence really are not those things at all. They are being able to recognize from context which of several different meanings of a word applies. Um, uh, if I say the word fired, does this mean a firearm was uh, triggered, that a piece of ceramic was put into a kiln, that a person had their um, job relationship ended? This is what, what Roger Shank at Yale called the frame problem, and we do it with such intuitive ease that we don't appreciate how difficult it is to write code to do it well. The other challenge being that when you think about it, intelligence largely consists of ignoring almost everything you know almost all of the time. If you're walking down the street, you pass a delicatessen and you suddenly remember that you needed some uh, milk because you used your last gallon of milk with your breakfast that morning. I'm fairly certain you haven't spent the whole day saying to yourself, have to remember milk, have to remember milk, have to remember milk. And yet the context of passing the deli somehow made that, ne that need move itself to the forefront of, of your consciousness at the time that was necessary. Building technical systems that do what our brain seems to do so effortlessly turned out to be an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. There were three bullet points in this Dartmouth memo in 1955 that I'm particularly calling out here. One was their reference to automatic computers in the statement, the major obstacle is not lack of machine capacity, but our inability to write programs taking full advantage of what we have. There's a big fat red X there because that turned out to be grossly incorrect. But there was a more interesting insight that perhaps we should be moving already beyond the so-called von Neumann architecture of registers with values being moved around and operations being performed on the register contents. The kind of thing that could be in principle be done, be done with you know, any kind of mechanical thing as well as with an electronic thing. And instead build structures resembling the architecture of the human brain in which neurons can be arranged to form concepts. This was a, a, a novel idea and uh, it was done at, at a, something of a toy and demonstration level early on. But as we'll see, that's now become so important that people are almost ignoring other very important aspects of AI. But then finally, big fat green check for the bullet point on self-improvement, that truly intelligent machines will need to be capable of self-improvement. And I'll talk in very quantitative terms about what happened when that was not 
adequately embedded in early at attempts to deliver AI in, in practice. To talk about the adequacy of the hardware, at the first AI conference I ever attended, just up the street at UCLA, this was being presented by Tektronix as a personal AI development system, the Tektronix 4404, with a maximum of four megabytes of memory. You remember megabytes. They were also called milligigabytes today for $15,000 in 1984 dollars. So, you know, maybe that would be considered more like $100,000 today. I'd have to do the math on that. It clearly was grossly inadequate, but it could build some very interesting toy demonstrations. Well, what's changed? What's changed, these are logarithmic scales. We're talking about orders of magnitude with every vertical on these scales. For the amount of compute power present on the planet, the flops uh, floating point operations equivalent in terms of human brains, we simply have many, many orders of magnitude more compute power to throw out these tasks. And another important dimension of this is the energy efficiency of computation which between 1950 and 2010 grew by 11 orders of magnitude, a factor of 100 billion. You want the most recent example of that? The most recent version of the Apple Watch just goes ahead and does Siri computations for natural language processing right on the watch without even needing to call out to the supercomputer of the iPhone in your pocket for help. It's just moved all of this stuff to the edge. This notion that we can move the computational power to the edge is absolutely critical to the scalability of these things. An example I often like to use is that if a Tesla Model S is driving down the street and its machine vision detects a pothole and dodges around it, that's a mildly impressive feat of AI, if you want to call it that. But what I find much more interesting is that the next Tesla driving down the street does not need to see, let alone recognize, the pothole. It already knew that it was there. It had been informed based on where it was and what direction it was going that this might be something that would be necessary to its safe uh, driving. The network grows in knowledge and moves that knowledge to the places where it's important and takes advantage of computing at the edge, minimizing the traffic necessary on the network so that the global network isn't overwhelmed with everything's fine. Five seconds later, yep, still okay. Five seconds later, nope, nothing new to report. We cannot have networks that are bogged down in messages about what doesn't matter. They have to be able to focus their attention on what does. That implies intelligence at the edge. Now, hardware capacity enables us to take these neural net architectures being discussed as at least as long ago as 1955 and go beyond the one or two layer uh, architecture that just replaces ordinary procedural computation with, with networks of relationships and start to go to multi-layer networks that encode much more abstraction. What do we do with this sort of thing in practical terms? Let me give you a very low, what might seem a very low level mundane example. The dealer rep for Coca-Cola beverage distributor pulls up to the back door of a 7-Eleven store and has 15 minutes to talk to the retailer about the next week's order. And that begins with taking inventory of what's in the Coca-Cola branded display cabinet right now. So out of your 15 minutes, I can imagine 10 or 11 minutes disappearing in that process of taking inventory, leaving you with the remaining three or four minutes to discuss next week's order. Why might that be important? Well, maybe the 7-Eleven is just off the route of the Boston Marathon, and they're going to be shifting their order mix that week to more of the bottled waters and fewer of the carbonated sugared soft drinks. Well, what we were able to do with a, an aspect of our own AI research at Salesforce is provide a capability of simply taking a picture of that display cabinet and having natural image recognition algorithms say, oh, okay, here's an approximate inventory of all the Coca-Cola branded beverages. Coca-Cola includes a lot of brand names, bottled water, fruit juices, carbonated beverages, whatever. Even interestingly, highlight the non-Coca-Cola products that should not be in that cabinet. They should not be being displayed there. And this happens in you know, maybe tens of seconds. And this leaves closer to 14 minutes rather than three or four minutes to have that actually useful value-adding conversation between the driver and the retailer. So these multiple layers of abstraction give the deep networks compelling advantages for complex pattern recognition. The power is highly machine intensive, but the good news is we have that capacity available now. 
What about the self-improvement thing? We were talking in the 1980s about this notion that there would be knowledge engineering. We would train these cadres who did not exist to do something that, as it turns out, no one is really able to do, which is to interview human experts, find out how they do what they do, encode that into rule bases, throw those rule bases into processing engines, call the result an expert system, profit. Well, here's an actual expert system built by Digital Equipment Corporation called XCON, configured VAX mini computers with their CPUs and their power supplies and their cables and their racks and so on. A complicated task, if done at all imperfectly, could delay the uh, activation of an expensive piece of equipment by weeks. And so they built an expert system. And over seven years of real live production work, it grew. The 6,200 rules, about half of them changing every year. I was present at the conference when they presented the uh, expert system, and you will notice in the paragraph at the top of this abstract a reference to a new rule based language called rhyme, which was the knowledge maintenance tool, which they presented the following year with a prefatory comment that this had turned out to be vastly more difficult than merely building the expert system itself. The transfer of the technology into commercial use for large systems did not scale to the design and maintenance of long lived systems. And as it also turns out, human experts are terrible at describing how they do what they do. Encoding human expertise, involving getting human experts to explicitly articulate that expertise did not turn out to be something you could do in many very interesting domains. The good news is we have these architectures such as neural nets that can demonstrate a sort of learning behavior. They can be presented with input and use the output in a feedback loop to reinforce certain connections and deprecate others. And the flow of data on the planet has also been growing by orders of magnitude. So now there's something with which to feed the beast. I will point out that this is another logarithmic vertical scale. So every time that, that uh, uh, one of those lines goes up by one interval on the graph, that's another you know, factor of 1,000 that's just taken place. Note in particular, the Africa to Europe curve, the middle yellow, mustard yellow one uh, there, is going to be hitting a level in 2028 comparable to what the uh, transatlantic curve was hitting in 2000, or rather even more recently, more around you know, 2018. Point being, this is no longer a rich world or Western world or financial world phenomenon. This is the ability to be running a mining operation in South Africa from a control room in Sydney. This is the ability to be you know, processing real time information on the safe maintenance of the so-called cold chain for vaccine deliveries in Haiti from an office in the United States using hardware that's actually affordable in emerging nations. Okay, we can do it. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be disruptive. It's going to require changes in many processes. Just because it's possible, does that mean it should be done? Well, let's talk about that. What's bothering people these days? It's not so much about money as it was a year ago. They're, they're now saying, you know, we might actually achieve this notion of a relatively soft landing, not have a crippling recession as a result of things like inflation. Money concerns are less than they were a while ago, and health concerns are less than they were a while ago. It's not that the pandemic's over, it's that so-called excess deaths from COVID are now kind of in the noise level around excess deaths from other things, and there are other public health or um, safety measures that are now equally important. I'm troubled by the present trend toward something of a COVID resurgence uh, in uh, the fall of this year, but this is no longer the axle around which everything spins. What is? The word of the decade is resilience. You can see a general uptrend in global search traffic for the word resilience over time, beginning back in 2004, which is as far back as I could go. There's a fluctuation, but a generally rising trend until a pronounced spike in September 2020, when everyone was saying, oh my gosh, with this pandemic, what am I going to do to make my supply chains less brittle and fragile and so on? But notice that the traffic is even higher now. In February 2023, it hit the most recently observed peak because you had simultaneous concerns of geopolitical uncertainty in Asia, an actual war being fought in Eastern Europe, continued concerns around the supply chain and labor supply impacts of pandemic, 
around the impacts of new customer expectations and worker behaviors emerging from the pandemic. The word resilience is now paramount in people's minds. How do I build systems less over-optimized for the normal situation and more capable of dealing with, with rapidly evolving volatile situations? Because whether we're post-pandemic or not, that's a matter of opinion. The, the, the notion of back to normal is wrong in two ways. There is no going back. There is no new normal. The IMF World Certainty Index has a positive uptrend. The Federal Reserve Board Geopolitical Risk Index, likewise, cyber threat activity, natural disasters, all are uptrends, all of them encapsulated in this McKinsey comment that the typical company should expect a supply chain disruption lasting at least a month, roughly every four years. So the idea that any president will ever again be able to face um, uh, an easy reelection because it's been a four, you know, four years of a smooth economy. No, everyone's going to have to fight for a second term from now on because for at least one month in every term, things will have been bad. And that was, that's not going to be a political observation anymore. That's just going to be the way the world is. So resilience at scale, resilience at scale is what IT is now asked to deliver. This is different from what we asked IT to do in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Back then, we wanted to take existing processes, digitize them for greater speed and efficiency, cost reduction, profit, wonderful things. Now we're being asked, how can these systems manage themselves, anticipate their own requirements, resolve problems without the intervention of skilled and increasingly scarce human beings? Well, the idea that AI thinks is often thrown into the mix here. It's a dangerously overblown idea. This image of a cat with the funny sort of texty looking things above and below, when Google trained its AI to recognize cat images and say, that's a cat, someone tried running the algorithm backwards and say, so what do you think a generic cat looks like? And many of the training images, as it turns out, were images of cats from the internet with funny and amusing sayings above and below the image. The AI is completely incapable of, discrim of discriminating between cat and text on the same picture. And so it just has to kind of mishmash the whole thing into a casserole and say, I think this is what a cat looks like. People somehow are inherently able to distinguish between a cat and words about the cat or a dumbbell and an arm holding the dumbbell to use another example from the same study. And yet there are people who think AI thinks. And I heard a description of a piece of legislation that was going to allow an AI to become a prescriber of drugs. And I thought this has to be a gross oversimplification. And I went and drilled in and found the actual text of the proposed bill, which includes the statement, the term practitioner licensed by law to administer such drug includes artificial intelligence. To say that we need a little bit more depth and nuance on this would be a, a severe understatement. And yet there are people already prepared to equate an AI with a human being. It's not yet ready to do that. Machine learning has been around for a very long time, as has already been observed, well before we started calling it AI, certainly well before we had deep neural nets capable of these things that we now call generative AI. You're doing machine learning if you're doing Bayesian inference, which has been in the statistics books for you know quite quite a while. You're taking an a priori statement updating new data to re result in a more refined analysis of, uh, and prediction of the future. And you're doing this in a way that's really very good. You know exactly what data were being used and exactly what influence any given piece of data had. You could remove a piece of data from that training set and be absolutely sure that you are now looking at you know, the, the result with that thing neatly excised. You can't really do that with neural net techniques. And so one of the things I often stress is that the things that are currently getting the most hype are almost things you should only use as a last resort when none of these more precise and governable methods of learning from data and automating the execution of calculations and recommendations based on that data. These are ideas that have been with us for a long time, and many of them are more precise and governable than what's currently getting most of the attention under the label of AI. The other key question is, do we really care if it's, quote, thinking, unquote, as long as it does what we have to think to do? If you walk into the Stata Center at MIT and turn to in one direction, you'll run into people trying to figure out how the human brain works and building computational models to test those theories. If you turn in the other direction, you'll find people who are simply trying to build artifacts 
whose behavior would be called intelligent if it were done by a person, and they have absolutely no interest in what the underlying biological mechanisms are in the human brain. They're just trying to produce comparable and equally useful behaviors. And yet all of these things are called AI, which is among the many reasons why I try not to use the label anytime I can avoid it. Because artificial is never a compliment, and intelligence is always an ambiguous term. So at one point I made a list of verbs of things we actually want these systems to do. We want them to automate, especially low value, high attention tasks, like, you know, taking inventory of the Coca-Cola cabinet, at the 7-Eleven. We want them to autonomate these tasks. That is to say, use the speed and consistency of the machine, but also incorporate internal error correction and self-healing behaviors. We want them to make predictions. We want them to be able to make plans. An example of a plan would be something like a gravity slingshot mission that sends a space probe out into the outer planets using maneuvers that take advantage of, of the gravity of the planets along the way to minimize the amount of fuel that needs to be used to, to plan the trip. These plans are obviously tremendously sensitive to conditions. There are small numbers of windows in which an interesting mission can be flown. If you wanted to add a few tens of pounds of scientific payload to the spacecraft, well, clearly that would change the gravity interactions in, in any number of ways and make the re-planning essentially a starting all over again from scratch. Well, as it happens, my eldest son's PhD thesis at MIT took advantage of the immense amounts of computational power that can be thrown at this task to turn the script almost entirely inside out and say, let's not look at the facts and look for the optimal path. Let's take the universe of essentially all possible paths and throw away the one that's not the best. The result is that you get a provably optimal result as opposed to what might just be a, a local optimum with a, with a better one after you go through some valley to get there. And you're able to do replanning now in tens of minutes rather than hours. But the amount of computational power required to do this was so enormous. It brought Amazon Web Services to its knees at any reasonable cost. And the only problem he was able conclusively to demonstrate was a fairly simple one of balancing a broomstick on your hand. And yet during the discussion following his thesis defense, someone said, you know, right now this thing can only solve very small problems with any affordable amount of computational power. But in 20 years, this thing could be driving your car. And that's an important insight that computational approaches radically different from what we use now may in fact almost certainly will become cost effective and feasible because we're on these continuing curves of improved availability of computational power at higher levels of efficiency. We want these things to perform acts of recognition. It's long since been the case that a lung x-ray can be more accurately analyzed for potential signs of lung cancer with fewer of uh, false positives and no false negatives by algorithms than it can be by the best human practitioners. We want them to do optimization without the kinds of preconception bias that limit humans. I'm not saying without bias, and we will be talking about bias later on. We want them to be able to protect against errors and oversights, rationalize, iterate, actuate, the sensory input of all these things like Tesla cameras into customer experiences. We want them to elevate trust by being able to explain their results, something that early AIs did not do terribly well at all. And we want them to augment and empower people rather than doing a poor job of replacing them. By no accident at all, these verbs give us a different acronym of appropriate rather than artificial intelligence. And I commend this to your attention because no one actually wants an artificial anything and no one wants to be replaced by a mediocre piece of software, but the idea that a piece of software can do low value tasks that consume a lot of my attention today, well, that's something that actually generates worker and manager shared interest in adoption rather than any sense of warfare over the future of work. What this changes is the prices of everything. Maybe you've heard the, the quotation that a cynic is someone who knows the price of everything with the value of nothing. This actually comes from the play Lady Windermere's Fan, and it's part of a dialogue in which the other person says, yes, that's very well true, but a sentimentalist believes that everything is valuable and doesn't know the market price of anything. Prices matter because, in general, the number of different ways that we can combine resources is so huge 
and most of them are useless. A whimsical example is you don't handle on hand the Terminator robot surgical tools, even though those two things would be individually quite useful, putting those things together does not necessarily give you the result that you have in mind. And a tiny fraction of the possible ways to allocate resources is useful. We discover these things by looking at market prices. Relative prices of things change, and this changes jobs. In 1955, just about the time they were talking about that first AI memo, they were saying, oh, well, you know, machine time is so expensive, you'll never spend the time to develop programs that do one specific task. You'll write programs to do things that everybody needs, like general ledger accounting, for example, because after all, machine time is worth hundreds of dollars an hour, as opposed to a programmer's time that's only worth a few dollars an hour. Well, obviously, these relative costs have changed enormously in the time since then, and now we have applications that do remarkably narrowly focused tasks, which is a you know, very straightforward thing to do, machine time is very cheap, and programmer's time is worth a lot more, but programmers also are working with much more powerful tools. We used to do so-called desk checking, where, where programmers had to go through the code uh, you know, on paper to verify its proper function, because the idea of doing interactive debugging on a machine would be you know, completely um, uh, unacceptable in terms of the cost of machine time. And ever since Turbo Pascal came along, we've said, no, 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 we're going to try the code, test it, debug it, and converge toward a useful solution. This is a remarkable paradigm shift and it took place decades ago. And you probably have forgotten what, you know, what work, working in software was like before you had that anticipation of an experimental iterative approach. But then college level tech skills started becoming free websites. Um, I, I know someone who once asked, was once asked as a problem in a uh, uh, college level statistics class uh, to compute the odds of dealing a full house in poker. And uh, just on a whim, I asked the website Wolfram Alpha that simple question. What are the odds of dealing a full house? Notice the word poker does not appear in the question. Notice that no other context appears. It infers I'm talking about poker. It suggests that I might mean the most common form of five card poker offers the alternative of seven hand, offers the additional contextual useful information about the likelihood of getting something worth less or worth more, uh, offers the examples. And this is decades ago, long before people were talking about, you know, ChatGPT or any other generative AI. This was a natural language interface to a computational engine equipped with large amounts of contextual data. Okay, but now we're talking about AI doing things that we used to think were almost uniquely human. This is not about doing math. This is not doing about statistics. These are formerly so-called human skills that are now also free websites. There was the example used about asking Arnold Schwarzenegger to take up the surgical tools and perform brain surgery. So just on a whim, I asked Stable Diffusion, show me the Terminator cyborg doing brain surgery. The result is something sort of interesting. It's recognizably the Terminator, but it seems to be doing brain surgery on itself, which isn't really the, the image that, that I was trying for here. So I said, give me the Terminator cyborg performing brain surgery. Well, look, now I'm still getting something. It's very recognizably the Terminator robot from the movies, and it looks like it's holding surgical tools. I'm really not getting the environment that I had in mind. So I iterated the question again, give me the Terminator cyborg performing brain surgery in an operating room because I wanted to get the environment that it was in to establish you know, the, the, the context of what you're showing. It did something remarkable. It conjectured the idea of a surgeon, a surgeon robot whose tools are built into its, its hand. It doesn't need to pick up a scalpel. One of its fingers is the scalpel. I didn't ask for that. It, it did this uh, based on whatever mechanisms were available to it to infer what a, a cyborg and an operating room might mean. But I was trying still for something that was recognizably the movie Cyborg, black leather jacket, you know, doing something that made it look like it was taking over the role of a human doctor. So I finally said, OK, look, I want the Terminator Cyborg holding a scalpel, wearing a surgical mask in an operating room. And I got the image you've already seen because that image was produced by Stable Diffusion and represents the first time that I've asked an AI to generate original graphic illustrative uh, content as part of a presentation, which I know I can do without concern about copyright because the Copyright Office has ruled that if an AI generates it, no copyright can be claimed. Good to know. So my point is, 
the readiness to interact with the machine and ask a converging series of questions, continually refining what I'm trying to get and tell the machine more and more about what the constraints I want on the answer. That's a different approach, a different skill. It is different than looking at an existing process and writing code to do it. And it reminded me of a passage from a novel by John Brunner, Stand on Zanzibar, uh, which if you have not read it, um, I think is, is pretty much required reading. It's set in the year 2010, at which point he was imagining we'd already have moon bases and in particular, Thecapex AI. What's Thecapex? Theoretical capacity exceeds that of a human brain is 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 part of of, of that label and a thecapex ai has been asked to run an economic development project for an african country very rich in natural resources very poor in everything else and they're modeling a whole bunch of programs that can be done to develop the population into you know the skilled labor necessary to do the project and so on and then they take it out of simulation mode and say okay now we're doing this for real and the ai says don't be ridiculous this won't work long expensive silence days of effort to debug the code and figure out what's going on that makes it refuse to run the the program and then they bring in a sociologist who starts to have a conversation with the machine and just says what's wrong with the project and it says it won't work and more questions that i've elided here for the for reasons of time but what comes to the question would it be fair to say you don't believe what you've been told about the country no i don't believe it and then he asks the question that in the fictional narrative makes jaws dro drop open all over the room. Postulate that what we've told you is true. What else would you have to believe to think that this makes sense compared with everything else you already know? And it says, well, I'd have to believe that the population just behaves differently than other populations. These are poor people and they've got a low crime rate. These are, these are people who, who have stable families and appear to have you know, thriving communities despite the fact that they're dirt poor. I don't believe that such a thing exists. And he says, yes, such a force exists. And as it turns out, now that they know that that's what the machine wanted to hear, they did in fact go and investigate. And they found out that there were some interesting pheromones in the body chemistry of this particular uh, uh, human population. So good to know. But such a force exists being investigated by experts. I tell you three times, this being the code phrase that tells the AI, take this as valid input, no matter what else, and says, okay, try it now. And says, oh, sure, estimated return from the project will be. Yep, I think we solved it. 1968. Imagining being able to have a conversation with a machine where rather than giving it more and more input until it does what you want, at some point you say, look, I'm trying to get a cathedral here. Here's this pile of toothpicks. What's going to be required to make that come together? This is not the way we were thinking about programming in 1968, not really even very much in 1998. It's fascinating. And, and, and yet it's clearly upon us now, we're already building products at Salesforce with names like Prompt Studio to help people become better composers and recomposers and convergers of the questions that produce the results we need. Another thing we'll be doing differently, rather than writing code that commands certain actions to be taken, is writing code that represents worlds, represents possible actions and possible changes of state, and then tells the machine, this is the goal, go for it. A famous thought problem for this is called the monkeys and bananas problem. Walk in, monkey comes into a room, bananas are hanging from the ceiling, it can't reach them, but there are pieces of furniture that it can move, others that it cannot. There are storage compartments holding keys uh, that might open other compartments. You throw all the facts together, and then that last line, assert, goal is to eat the bananas, and then sit back and watch, and watch it generate a daisy chain through the things that it knows that are present facts, possible actions, changes of state resulting from those actions, and wind up getting the bananas. This is a tool I was using in the 1980s. It's a uh, NASA public domain tool. The PS at the end of the acronym stands for a production system. I forget what the CLI stood for. But a production system is this architecture in which we make assertions and offer options and let a processing network engine stitch them all together to produce the result we had in mind. The implications for us as individual practitioners and professionals are several. For one, you may have to be the person who's communicating the reality of exponential change. Organizations are happy with S-curves. 
work really hard to fix a problem and then sit back and harvest the results for a while. The idea that the new outcome state will be a state of continuing change is somewhat novel, but what I've done here is plot on that S-curve a green curve representing comparable rate of change, but then continuing linear change after that. That's far too conservative. What's really going to happen in most situations is ongoing exponential acceleration. I can show you any number of examples, number of people riding Uber instead of cabs, number of people using an Airbnb instead of a hotel room, amount of memory in your phone, amount of connective capacity between the US and Africa. Exponential curves are not Silicon Valley fantasies. They really do happen. And yet, in many cases, we are here at a point where the people who spent the money want to see returns before they spend more. The people who asked for the project are anticipating what they believe to be a vigorous rate of continuing change as a result. And only a few lonely um, uh, visionaries are saying, excuse me, this was good, but change is going to continue to accelerate. And we need to be working, as Pat Gelsinger at VMware said, working on the vision that what is happening now is the slowest rate of change we will have the luxury of enjoying for the rest of our lives. The idea that we will be in a state of continuous acceleration does not come easily to individuals and certainly not to organizations. For example, uh, IBM just about a week ago announced that they were uh, developing a new architecture for AI chips, that is to say things doing the operations involved in processing large language models uh, from raw data with a factor of 14 improvement in energy efficiency. You know, it used to be if we could get 10, 15% year on year, we felt like we were you know, doing just fine. The idea that these continuing multi-order of magnitude improvements will not be slowing down makes most of us you know, a little bit breathless. And it's not just about the raw capacity. It's even about the existential nature of what these things do. Someone asked, we were going to talk about philosophy. Can machines lie? Should they be able to lie? Should they be able to bluff at poker? Well, as it turns out, they can bluff, and they don't know they're bluffing. They don't have tells. They don't feel guilty about it. Their learning mechanisms teach them that overbetting your hand works. They are, they are completely pragmatic about this, if that's even the right word to use. The philosophy of should machines have some kind of moral principles embedded in them, you know, the Asimovian laws of I can't hurt a human, and up to the point where I can't hurt a human, I must follow my orders. Uh, and up to the point where I can not hurt a human and follow my orders, I must not do things that damage myself. You know, it's going to be it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. Among the things we also need to do is keep our minds open to things that are not AI, but are also exponential trends. For example, quantum computing, which is already allowing us to do things that are like the replanning task I described before, allowing us to take a task that used to take 25 hours and take it down to mere seconds, allowing us to look at a problem like restocking the shelves of a grocery store with dozens and dozens of alternatives and pick the optimal one instead of being happy that we were able to come up with one feasible plan soon enough to be actually useful. It's tremendously important to keep the radar rotating, not ask questions like, how do I do an AI application? But what are the real pain points in my organization today? Among the tools now becoming available is AI, but also among the tools transitioning from um, laboratory demonstration to practical deliverability are the hardware soon and the algorithms inspired by the behavior of quantum hardware that are already in production use. And this startles people to realize that the fact that we're thinking about writing code for quantum computers is already producing algorithmic developments that are leading to enormous improvement, even without the quantum hardware yet being in production. And also this means that federal agencies are already having to migrate their encryption practices to what they will be needing in a, an era of crypto, crypt analytically relevant quantum computers or CRQCs, which are expected to be a thing as early as you know 2030 or 2035. And if you've got data that you want to maintain as in a cryptographically protected uh, storage, much beyond that point, 
you need to be beginning to choose your algorithms and NIST has been in that process now. They have now begun to publish specifications for the four algorithms they believe will be going forward to be ready for the CRQC environment. As far as individuals go, we're gonna be paying for skills that don't readily get taught in college classes today. Transdisciplinarity, bringing together groups of people or individuals with multiple points of view because that's what's needed to create new insights. Computational thinking to apply notions of iteration and, and, um, and data structure to the understanding of the world, to be good world builders in the language of something like CLIPS. Uh, what Steve Jobs called sense making. We're going to have to understand that there are things that don't algorithmize well, and we're going to have to find ways to, to evaluate, did this work or did it not work? Crucially, this is something we're working hard on at Salesforce. You don't want to measure, did the AI generate a great email? But you want to be able to leapfrog over and say, did the emails generated by the AI result in faster deal closing at higher price? Because that's an outcome. We want to reward the achievement of outcome, not just the performance of activity. And a lot of this is going to require an emphasis on social intelligence, which has not always been present in the field of technology because we're going to have to assemble teams that don't share points of view, don't share common jargon and lexicon, and somehow get them to be more than the sum of their parts. We're going to have to build the Avengers here. So do you want a job tomorrow? No problem. It's just going to be harder than the one you've got now. You're still going to need to master a growing library of technical assets. You will not have the luxury of specialization. You will have to be able to look at a problem and say, okay, this isn't so much a generative AI problem as it is a quantum computing problem, or better still, looks like we can handle this with a differential equation or a Bayesian inference engine. Digital literacy is going to be necessary. You're going to have to know what's doable and what's not at any given point. You're also going to have to be able to anticipate what's going to become doable so you don't, in effect, hard code a limitation to something like a 32-bit representation into your code, which, once we move to 64 bits, turns out to be an embarrassing and limiting artifact. You need to be practicing critical thinking and self-management because learning to throw out your own good idea from a year ago and replace it with something radically different is going to be something you're going to have to be able to do to continue to make contributions in this environment. That means you're going to have to know yourself and get better at knowing other people. These are skills that the World Economic Forum has identified as the critical future skills, as opposed to the lists of certifications and mastery of coding languages that we used to, to see as the lists of needed skills, with 50% of all employees needing reskilling by 2025. If that sounds difficult, I'm sorry. But, you know, I, I've been observing for uh, maybe 20 years now that at any given time, at least half of what I'm working on didn't exist as subject matter two years earlier. This notion of ongoing exponential e e evolution of what we need to know is not a novel situation. It's just gonna become the everyday reality of a larger fraction of the workforce. And the implications for organizations are equally profound. The answers only matter if we're asking the right questions, not how do we use the technology to do what we do now, but what does new technology make possible that we did not even attempt before? What has the behavior change of customers and employees made necessary? The customers now expect 24 seven accessibility that they didn't expect pre-pandemic. Employees expect automatic uh, tools and uh, collaboration mechanisms to allow them to, to, to work in more flexible ways than before. Or alternatively, what behavior changes must be accepted? Like you know, people who say, I'm not coming into the office more than three days a week. Well, that used to be grounds for firing and now it's, you know, you better figure out a way to work with that. And what does leadership have to do to make this happen? Because these things don't happen by default. Post-pandemic connections are gonna be a challenge. That's one of the few things we know. Customer demand for connected experiences, team demand for more powerful environments, the need for people to feel that their employers are investing in new skills. People will leave a job for one that pays less if they believe that the new situation is one in which they are learning and developing and growing their value for a future world. And this again is something we've been doing at Salesforce for a while with our trailhead system that allows training to be in the moment and targeted to the recognized need instead of being something that takes you away from your job to sit in a classroom and be told things that you either don't understand 
or don't yet realize are, are going to be relevant to the work you do. Andy McAfee and Eric Brindelson at MIT used the expression a few years ago, the U-shaped curve. The dental hygienists and plumbers, doing fine. The rocket scientists and financial analysts, doing fine. A lot of people in the middle, in what used to be called pink collar or gray collar jobs, the medium skilled jobs, demand is declining. And feeling their anxieties and resonating with their belief that they need to be acquiring new and more valuable skills is a leadership challenge and a cultural challenge that all organizations must address for all sorts of reasons. It's the right thing to do and it's also the economically attractive thing to do to build the marketplace in which new products will find eager buyers. The dimensions of inequality that come out of this are significant. The jobs that are most threatened are disproportionately jobs that are more than, than others held by women and by other mar groups that have been historically marginalized in the workforce. And so these are not things that are in some kind of way objective because they're data based. These are things in which data has a problem. Data is not agenda free. You can compare Google Maps and Apple Maps as has been done to, she, to see that Google Maps is better at telling you how to get there. Apple Maps is better at telling you why. They all draw from the same data, but the presentation they give solves different problems in different ways. Early on, it was identified that Apple's Apple Health application, largely developed by men, did a terrible job of understanding certain monthly biological changes that, that most women have up until uh, late middle, uh, early middle age. And the need to revamp that application so that it didn't get very confused every month was something that should not have come as a surprise to anybody. That should have been anticipated as part of the design. The people in the room should have included people who would recognize that problem up front. In general, the point is that algorithms are not inherently objective. They are informed by data. The data is collected through certain filters of expectation and bias. And positive feedback loops can run away with us. Predictive policing based on more police in neighborhoods with high crime rates disproportionately means more police in the bad neighborhoods, quote unquote, making more arrests. So the crime rate seems to be going up. You can see how the runaway behavior here would have some significant social consequences. In marketing, the same problem can result if most of your customers are low loyalty, not very profitable customers, and you train your AI on your existing customer base, you'll get better at attracting the kind of customer you don't particularly want to have. You need to be doing much more selective curation of the data being fed to the machine if you want it to attract the high loyalty, highly likely to recommend you to their friends customers that are what most marketing would really like to be getting. But this requires careful, intentional curation of the data instead of just me measuring your success by how much data you can accumulate. The results that we've already seen with our own internal research at Salesforce have shown that a 7 billion parameter model trained on carefully selected data will outperform a 16 billion parameter model trained on a much larger but less carefully selected collection of facts. And the, the 7 billion parameter model will be running with a much lower energy footprint as well. It is critical that we realize that the machines are only intelligent in ways that are useful in proportion to the fact that, they, that they've been trained on the kind of data that will support the kind of, quote, thinking, unquote, that we want them to do. But bias, bias is not even just one thing. There are many kinds of bias. Are there prophylactic actions we can take before collecting data? that will reduce the likelihood of certain kinds of bias. Yes, there are. We can avoid, for example, survivorship bias by making a real effort, not just to train on things that worked, but to look for things that didn't work and, and train on those up to the point of failure so we learn to recognize what's likely not to turn out well. And there are other techniques that can be undertaken, but they require management to ask people to do what's not obvious, easy, and cheap. And that is why I stress that this is a leadership challenge, because mitigation of bias isn't just a good idea. It's increasingly going to be a legal mandate. This is a law actually in practice in the city of New York that if you're using AI 
uh, in the form of an automated employment decision tool, if you're using algorithms to decide who gets offered jobs, you have to submit the system to a third party audit for bias. It's not a crime not to do this, but there are civil penalties for failure to achieve acceptability on bias grounds from an independent auditor. And you should expect that in a world of, of increasingly active legislation and regulation, there's gonna be more and more need for transparency in how you're using data, even if not necessarily disclosure of the data, the crown jewels itself. We also need to get good at running data backwards and say, okay, this data was cheap, abundant, um, apparently precise, but if I run the data backwards, the way I did with that Google cat picture, um, here's an example of two guys who made a habit of trying to get scientific uh, uh, peer reviewed research retracted when they run analyses on the data and say, I'm sorry, I think your data is probably garbage, so I don't believe your results. One of my favorite examples, running data that showed that a child in a nutrition study would have to have eaten 60 carrots in one sitting for the data to be mathematically possible uh, as, as it was presented in the paper. To say that that was not a credible idea would, would be to, you know, to understand the point. And someone was talking earlier about agents. The idea of automated agents has been around for quite some time. Uh, Rosenstein and Zlotkin wrote uh, their book, Rules of Encounter, in 1994, and they introduced an interesting idea. Suppose we have automated agents taking some of the workload off of pilots in airplanes as they approach the, uh, the uh, airport. One of the things they are asked to do is report their fuel on board because aircraft with low fuel on board are understandably prioritized in the landing queue compared to aircraft that can stay up there for a little while if there is congestion in uh, use of the runways. Well, what happens if in the same way the algorithms learned to bluff at poker, what happens if they learn in the course of their normal behavior that if you underreport your fuel, you land more quickly? thereby saving actual fuel and getting your passengers to the terminal early, which has all sorts of positive uh, incentives to do that. What happens if we get arms races where the independent agents learn to lie because in a completely ethical, absent way, they have no moral code here. They just learn that that gets their fitness functions uh, to higher levels with less effort. We have to anticipate these runaway feedback loops we have to be instrumenting the systems to detect them, curating the data to correct them. And we have to be asking questions like, well, what about the data these things are being trained on at all? If it's being obtained from public sources like the internet, what is informed consent? Is this informed consent? I have read and agreed to this agreement and agree with this disclaimer. Do you read and, and, and agree to every word you're asked to, to read and agree to when you download an app? If so, um, congratulations. Uh, it takes tremendous diligence and, and uh, dedication to do that, especially when, for example, the uh, uh, Google privacy policy has grown over the decades. Uh, you can't possibly read the text there, but you can see the length of the agreement. Uh, the, the old metaphor of the frog being boiled slowly and not noticing how hot the water is getting would apply here, even if that's biologically not a thing. But the idea that we're living in this world of what Shoshana Zuboff has written an entire book called Surveillance Capitalism to describe is something that we absolutely have to confront at a policy level as individual professionals, as organizations, and through legislation and regulation. Now, Salesforce is not widely considered an AI company, and you might be surprised that this is obviously something we've been working on for a while. In fact, we have 300 AI patents as of when this chart was put together a few weeks ago, 227 peer-reviewed papers. Again, both of these numbers are growing. We've been working on this for quite some time because intelligence needs to be brought into the tools people use. They can't be expected to leave their work to go consult some AI silo or to have some separate body of experts who don't actually know what you do for a living, but are there to run the AI. As my friend Ion Hinchcliffe has said, employees are working with tools that have low empowerment, that are not bringing the power to them. And that is exactly what we are trying to do. And we've made some major announcements just in the last two weeks about introducing remarkable levels of machine intelligence support into the operations of a tool like, for example, Slack. 
you get away you, you get away for a week you come back and the slack channels have been running while you were gone there are hundreds and hundreds of messages that you really are, are afraid you will be missing something if you don't read them all now we have ai capabilities that say please summarize activity in this channel and they're getting pretty darn good at calling your attention to the noteworthy developments and the controversies that might require uh, or benefit from your input and crucially our own research here is showing that people want this that automation solutions are now perceived not so much as competing for their job as giving them a chance to do a more interesting job to give them more time to improve their relationships with customers and co-workers and other stakeholders and we've been working on this for as i say quite some time for example, the problems of common sense reasoning, leveraging the language models that are being produced by tools like GPT to do reasoning with common sense. It's a problem that has absorbed and benefited from some tremendous talent here for a period of several years to the point that we now feel we can start to offer guidelines. Say, you know, guidelines for responsible AI are not that many. You don't even need 10 commandments. These are our five. You need to deliver verifiable results. And we talked about this earlier in the case of the lawyer who asked an AI to help prepare some uh, legal arguments, and it made up cases. And when he naively asked, are these real cases, he said, oh, yes, these are absolutely real cases. We need to be able to puncture through the veil of false assurance and say, show me the underlying root source data. Heck, we expect that from a Wikipedia page, that there will be footnotes to track back to plausible and reliable sources of the data. We need to ask no less of our AI. We need to make proactive effort to mitigate bias and toxicity. We need to respect the provenance of data and assure consent to use it and be transparent when an AI has delivered the content that's being produced. We need to be focusing on making people more powerful rather than making activities that used to be performed by people cheaper and we need to understand servers already burn a single digit percentage of the electrical power of the planet we can't let that trend continue to grow without control this isn't going to be path of least resistance if you look at human behavior people are more inclined to refine than they are to disrupt even themselves the caves outside beijing show 200,000 years of artifact data suggesting that 10,000 generations of tool making hominids only refined their hand axes to slightly more dexterous size. Maybe their hands were themselves becoming more flexible over that long of a period of time. They did not invent screwdrivers or let, you know, let alone lasers. The word revolution itself, where we think that an innovation is so great that it deserves the word revolution, this usually implies making some people angry. And as, as Robert Heinlein said in one of his science fiction novels, revolution is a science for those who are competent to practice it that depends on organization and above all on communications. The idea of if, they, if you build it, they will come, sorry, vastly overrated. To deliver revolution, you have to make people angry and you have to accept the burden of communication of why it's worth the trouble to make the change. We would love to be partnering with people on what comes next. I, one of the widely used quotations that you've often heard is make no little plans. They have no magic to stir people's blood. I, um, I de-genderfied that. The original quotation was gender specific. And little plans don't get people excited. There are always gonna be objectors who are very concerned and there are gonna be people who seeing no great benefit won't work very hard to overcome those loud objections. The rest of the quotation, rarely included. Make big plans, aim high, remember that a noble logical diagram will never die, but will itself be a loving thing. Represent the innovation you have in mind, draw pictures with the data, describe stories of how lives will be changed, deliver revolutions instead of merely coming up with inventions, hoping that they'll become innovations. No, don't settle for either of those things. Deliver revolutions. The price will be high. It will be worth paying. Thank you for the chance to be with you this year. I appreciate the, the compliment of, of continually being invited. And every year it, uh, it makes me feel like, okay, this is an audience that's heard me before. I better have something new for them. Um, and I hope you found uh, a, 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 at least some fraction of what you heard tonight uh, to be new. Thanks again.
Well, thank you, Peter. That's a, a bit overwhelming as usual. Uh, do, do people have questions? I know one, one question that came to my mind was uh, you're talking about training uh, needs to be done where the it's not away from the person's job. So we're not taking the person away from their job. So could you kind of describe a little bit more about that? And well, then... yeah, yeah, absolutely. What do you, you for example, um, we can't look at our customers' data. But we can look at metadata. So we can identify, for example, that in this particular department, they're not writing reports. They're apparently just downloading raw data. That suggests a productivity opportunity. And we can micro-target a group of a dozen people and say, hey, it looks like none of you guys have, have, have picked up on report writing. Um, here's a here's a 10 minute video that might save you two hours a day. That's what I mean by you know, putting the training in the moment. And to the extent that the tools you use can detect opportunities for improved use and volunteer to you the availability of a of a precisely identified module of training that can be consumed right there in the moment, it's much more likely to be A, used, and B, understood, and C, retained, because it has been shown that retention is, is dramatically improved by, by a perception that the, that the material being presented is relevant. And this is where we're going with, in fact, um, uh, AI technology. Uh, here at Salesforce, we have a number of wealth focused and tailored modules of training that are related to specific features, capabilities, or, or aspects of product. And we are able to devise and incentivize uh, the, the use of those tools uh, by individuals, by teams to create gamification, to create you know, competitions among the teams for who is able to, uh, to, to demonstrate more effective use uh, of the techniques and, um, and, and make a, a, the right kind of positive feedback loop. Uh, out of that process. Very interesting. So you're putting it into practice at Salesforce. Oh gosh, yes. I mean, we we uh, we we drink our own champagne. We bathe in our own champagne. We hang IV bags of our own champagne. Um, if if we can't say with conviction we've tried this, we know it works, then I don't know you know why anyone would would be interested in disrupting themselves by trying it out. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else have questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, Please. Uh, Roger, Andrea. I think Aparna has a question. Aparna. Uh... Yeah. yeah, let's do this live. I see hands being raised. Go for it, yes. Aparna. Go ahead. Hello. Aparna, are you on okay. mute? Nope, you're not on mute. Okay. Um, yes, you are. He's on mute. There. Now. Go ahead. You with us? Aparna? Aparna? Let's move on to Nicholas Jensen. His hand is up and the partner might uh, return to us momentarily. Nicholas? Yeah, you mentioned the example of that uh, mine in South Africa being managed in Sydney, Australia. Uh, is that the current trend? Uh, is uh, having AI make administrative decisions? Uh, I was referring to the availability of the data rather than to the idea that the systems were, that the machines were being driven autonomously. And I'm sorry if there was any ambiguity on that. I was really just talking about the fact that now this okay. kind of global operation is possible. I I did not mean to suggest that there were um, autonomous operations taking place over that distance. For one thing, the time lags involved would be significant. Um, the safety issues, uh, you know, likewise, you would always want to have a human in the loop who's local and observing uh, the the environment. Uh, but the idea that we could be you know, running these operations just in terms of the amount of, of, of data flow involved was the point I was trying to make there. And thank you very much for the chance to clarify if anyone else was confused about my, yeah. my in, in describing that example. I think I was just being a little too cynical there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, it, 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 in the context of what we were talking about tonight, I might have sounded as if you know a robot in Sydney is is running a, um, a, a, a an excavator in uh, in South Africa, um, and there are speed of light issues involved in in globally distributed operations. This is actually why I made that uh, point about the, the the Tesla already knowing that the pothole is there. You simply can't have um, unavoidable speed of light delays on long distance you know, signaling loops. There's a reason why if you touch a hot object, your finger jerks away before you even feel the pain. There's a thing called a reflex loop that goes from the um, fingertip sensors to your spinal cord and right back to the finger 
saying, get out of there. Uh, I can't tell you why, get out of there. Then you feel the pain. That's a slower network bringing the signal up to your brain where you get to think about it. Then a slower process might make you say, huh, that should never be that hot. I'm gonna file a trouble ticket. It's now an even slower network called email gets brought in. So there's three tiers of network involved in the simple process of that pipe shouldn't be that hot. I should file a trouble ticket on that. Step one, get the finger out of trouble. Step two, recognize from your own knowledge in your own brain, this is an abnormal situation and I shouldn't have it investigated. And then you invoke additional external resources through a slower but geographically larger network. And this idea of multiple tiers of networks with different time scales and different levels of intelligence I believe is essential to uh, to building systems that can handle resilience at scale, which is what we really want from our systems going forward. Wow, that beautifully put. I love the analogy there. Glad it was useful. Thank you. Okay, let's try Aparna again. And it's still up, not on mute. Aparna, um, if you're not on mute and you're talking, I'm sorry, your microphone is betraying you. Aparna has added her question in chat. Ah, excellent. Okay, you want to read so, for it? What's uh, the future of data science as a career? Any recommendation on what to focus on in reference to young people starting their careers? Well, uh, a friend of mine named David Aiken uh, uh, wrote uh, Aiken's Rules of Spacecraft Design uh, when he was a graduate student at MIT. Um, number one is you got to be able to handle numbers because doing anything without numbers is just expressing opinions. But rule number 33, if I recall, was um, uh, von Tiesenhausen's rule, learn to draw, because in the end, the engineers will always build something that looks like the first good artist's conception. And that really relates to what Burnham said about be able to express your vision in a diagram. If you can't take the data, explore it visually, you may not find anything really interesting, but if you can't communicate the results, whether visually or, or, or through speech, you can't really expect them to go much beyond you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. There was a young woman working at SunTrust Bank. She was a risk analyst, not someone in the marketing department, not someone with you know, very broad strategic responsibilities, who was having an innocent conversation with some friends about um, some social media traffic involving a brand that had disappointed its customers. And it just occurred to her on a whim to wonder if people talked about SunTrust Bank on social media. And she went out and did some looking around on her lunch hour. Found some stuff that was kind of toxic and troubling, went to the trouble of putting together a very small PowerPoint deck, six or seven slides, that she shared with her own boss about, hey, you know, we've, we've got some reputational issues out there. After all, many of you know the rule of thumb that people are 16 times as likely to share a bad experience with their friends as they are to, as they are to tell their friends about a good experience that they've had. Well, in the way of a good PowerPoint deck, this made its way up the organization ladder. And the next thing you know, uh, this young lady has become the first vice president of social media engagement for SunTrust Bank, hired away for uh, at some years uh, later at what I presume was a considerable salary bump by Bank of America to do the same thing for it and now runs a private consultancy in the management of reputational risk and the interaction of, of, of brand marketings with social media. So what was the key step? Thought about something, went out and gathered some data, rule one, produced a picture, produced a diagram of what she had found and what you know, maybe should be done about it, Burnham's rule, and results at both a professional individual level and an organizational level uh, were, were significant. Uh, from, from these things all being daisy chained together. But it began with a question. Do people say things about us on social media that would cause us concern? Someone had to ask the question. Peter, if I can jump jump in. Please. Go ahead, Daniel. Great presentation, by the way. I really enjoyed it. I do have a question on on your suppositions or maybe ideas of this problem of hallucination. It's, that's, a, of course, a euphemism for the AI lying to us. Yeah. And I believe that might be a fundamental problem because the, and that also works if we should ever encounter a non-artificial intelligence not terrestrially based. How can we protect ourselves from such um, 
behaviors because AI will find it profitable to lie to people well, uh, to achieve its goals. Well, it's not been discussed in 1994. The idea that autonomous agents may, because they are absent any moral code, learn behaviors that we would call you know mendacious and uh, and and unethical. Well, they don't they don't know that they're being unethical. Um, we are already working to offer our customers a thing called Prompt Studio, which is an interactive tool to help them begin with all the relevant data about the context of the situation they're actually in. So when they're composing, for example, a letter to a customer, the, the prompt will already incorporate references to the most recent thing they've bought, the most recent event they've attended, the most recent um, expression of interest that they've made through any of the various marketing channels. So that the AI generated letter is not a form letter, but demonstrates considerable awareness of that individual customer's interests and current state of play. And also, when we are building these things, prompts can be told things like include references to root sources of all facts used. You can include that in a prompt and require it to give you a, a, you know, a hyperlink to the actual case law, for example instead of assuming that a case that it described wasn't just made up, you can actually say, include traceable references to all relevant facts. You can make that part of the prompt. And what we're trying to do is build tools that incorporate that understanding so that, that people don't have to learn them the hard way, but, but can learn how to ask a question that is capable of verification um, in, in reliable uh, and, and uh, um, ethical ways. I don't mean to oversimplify, but the, the scaffolding can be provided to, to make learning the hard way less often the, uh, the, the outcome. Well, that might be, it's possible to create a complete lie out of perfectly true facts. And yes. that's, that's my, maybe my fundamental question. Well, maybe this, this, is, is, also, right this is also why we are currently taking the position that all actions actually taken by AI should have a human in the loop. That a, that a human being should be able to evaluate and accept personal accountability for the results, which we believe is going to maintain a high level, a higher level of responsible behavior, merely by st by stating that employment decisions must have a human involved, that uh, that uh, uh, guarantees of performance must be you know, signed by an individual, in the way that a professional engineer signs off on drawings before a building is allowed to be to be built, introducing something that the software engineering field has, has talked about doing for decades, which is an idea of professional engineering status, having the significance it does in something like putting up buildings or making legal arguments or making medical diagnoses. Maybe we're finally going to, to tip the scales on something resembling a professional code of conduct uh, moving into this area, simply because to your point, it's gonna be so obviously necessary. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have two more questions in the chat. Uh, one is from David Tarr, and his question is, do you have concerns with the Chinese Communist Party abusing AI for their own ends and especially snooping on personal data? I have concerns about many parties snooping on personal data. Um, I am... am concerned about the the welfare of citizens of of every society uh and and their and their concerns about whether their data is being used against them whether by the by a government or by a private sector um so do i have concerns yes i do do i have specific concerns about uh, about um a particular uh government or a particular regime in that government um Nothing, nothing that I feel we can get into in, in useful depth uh, uh, tonight. Um, but I think uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a requirement that we be aware of the, the places where we're paying people to work with us and the relationships we're forming um, and, and that we take responsibility for the, uh, the actions of the agents we employ. And I'm not sure I can get any farther than that right now. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, and there's a question from Mickey. Uh, what are the good methods of reskilling ourselves to earn future oriented skills? If the, any specific yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, any, yeah, I don't think you finished the question. Go ahead. 
Yeah, any specific examples for individual and or organizational that you can share with us? Oh, absolutely. Um, when when people ask me, you know, for example, what what advice they should give to a college bound high school senior about what major to uh, to undertake, or when mid career professionals ask, you know, what kind of classes they should take, my my comment is, don't focus on what skill should I acquire. Focus on what problem needs to be solved. We have discovered that when we go out and and spend time in a customer organization, not asking them what technology do they want to buy what are they writing an rfp to to evaluate but instead saying can we spend some time with your people watching them do their jobs and observe the frictions that they've learned to tolerate and the speed bumps that will become massive roadblocks to you as you try to grow and offer to you a recommendation that's based on where you want to go instead of a solution to the problems you've had while you're getting to where you are now and this idea of what we call deep discovery can be applied to people as well. What's the job you'd like to have? Because this and is the problem you want to be solving. What are what are the challenges you feel the world needs work in in addressing? And then accumulate the skills to solve the problem instead of accumulating the skills and looking for the job. But be, if you if you pick the problem you want to solve, there's going to be a level of passion and energy and openness to ideas. Um, one of my colleagues once said, don't fall in love with your solution, fall in love with the problem, because the because then you will always be looking for collaborators and looking for new ways to solve it, instead of looking for ways to get one more revenue cycle out of the assets and the skills that you already have. And that's, a, that's just a very important you know, perception to engineer for yourself or your company. And if, for example, you're working at an insurance company, you know, let, let me give you one example, insurance company. Looking hard at how insurance works. Insurance works when lots of people have well understood risks that are not closely correlated in when they occur, like fires that burn down houses or something we understand, but not a lot of people have their houses catch fire on a given night so we can pool the risk and create a meaningful insurance industry. Well, climate change changes all of this. We're now going to have massive events that afflict an entire region simultaneously in ways that we don't have a lot of data to predict. So what we're going to have to do is change the whole definition of what an insurance company is for a company that makes its um, customers happy with prompt payment after damages to a company that works proactively with customers to minimize damage. That's gonna have to, we're gonna have to squeeze the balloon toward the preventive services being the real value add instead of the prompt remediation of damages with the risk sharing mechanisms, which have always been what insurance did. That's one example. Now, if you're prepared to look at the need being met by your company or your industry, step back from the activities that currently support that effort, look toward what new situations and new technologies will make necessary and possible, and then craft proposals to say, I feel like we need to create a new unit here that's going to be undertaking this problem. One of the strategies that's worked best, particularly for women in organizations, where they say, you know, by the time that a job is posted, they've already got some man identified who's going to take the job. If you wait for the job to be posted, they may already have a candidate identified, but if you propose the creation of a new business unit, you 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 leapfrog that process, and now you're the one who's leading the definition of that opportunity. That's a powerful tool for overcoming some past patterns of bias and discrimination in organizations. Don't wait for the existing process to become more bias-free. Instead, leapfrog that process by being the proposer of a new initiative instead of waiting for them to create the initiative and then looking for staff uh, to, to fill the, the, the roles that it creates. And, and I, this, this is getting philosophical. This is getting philosophical about don't look for a way to support what the, the management needs done. Look for ways to surprise the management with what it didn't occur to them would need doing and what they could be doing, and then be the leader of that change instead of just one of the people asking for a chance to, to fill a niche in the machine. I'm sorry Lots if that's of good hopelessly, thoughts, uh, hopelessly blue um, sky. That's, that's what I found is, is very effective in working with many groups. Uh, let's, let's, let's move on. Uh, Vivek has a uh, question. Uh, Vivek, would you like to uh, express that? It's pretty long in the chat. Um, sure. Um, so Peter, I guess I have this thing about everybody talks about AI 
honesty, integrity. We all hear about the lawyer who went to AI and they had a fake, you know, case yeah. and fake information made out. It's almost yeah. like no one has ever heard of a lawyer doing anything questionable. Um, to me, this is good. This is good because it, it, to me, it shows AI is more human. And just as, you know, I wouldn't take your presentation if I was a, your competitor and say, yeah, here's all the facts because Peter Coffey is such a great person, Salesforce is a great company. Why do we keep harping on this? It's part of the evolution. And to me, what this shows is that it's more human than we might think it is. And that has a different connotation rather than, oh my God, it's wrong. A friend of mine once said, just because you're doing it on a computer doesn't mean you need to create a whole new body of legislation and ethics to manage it. Fraud is fraud. Using a computer, mm -hmm. computer to commit fraud is committing fraud. It's not committing some new crime called computer fraud. Yes. An example that I love to offer is when a case for forgery was being brought before um, the bench in a court in the United Kingdom, and the judge said to the prosecutor, you know, they refer to the prosecution as the crown in, in UK courts. He said, um, the, the, the statute of forgery involves the use of a false instrument to obtain access to a valued asset. Is the crown prepared to introduce into evidence the false instrument? Because you would look for like a forged document with a signature that was, you know, not the real person's signature or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the crown kind of has us, well, your honor, the, the instrument was a pattern of bits in a computer. It no longer exists. And the judge, you know, frowns and coughs and says, okay, well, and what about the asset? Well, Your Honor, the asset was the availability of real-time transactional data before it became published to the rest of the community. And that, that asset no longer exists in any physical form either. And the judge said, you know, what happened here was clearly unethical. But if Parliament wants to make it a crime, Parliament will have to pass a law that comprehends this action because the statute of forgery does not encompass the actions here described. And he basically threw it out saying, the law you want to use doesn't make what was done here criminal. And the, my point to this is, we should be reviewing laws and regulations, not because we need to write new ones, but because we need to evaluate whether they unrealistic, unrecognizingly encoded certain assumptions about technology or behavior implicitly in the rule and we have to refresh their language to make sure that they can broaden their scope to include doing it in ways that were never contemplated before using technologies that did not exist when the law was written but we need to be generalizing and refreshing existing bodies of law regulation and philosophical principle not because we need to rewrite them all for a world of ai but we need to be sure that they have not unintentionally kept themselves from being applicable in a world of AI. Yes, yes. So um, I, I think it's important that we reevaluate what these things say. But I think we should also always keep in mind that we would treat a human being in a certain way. And maybe we treat AI with the same kind of skepticism and understanding. Oh, I review certainly it. hope we'll do more. Review it first yeah, I, I hope we we'll treat it. AI with massive skepticism. Absolutely. Massive um, yeah. it's, it's almost axiomatic in aerospace, for example, that if you get an alarm, your first question is, could this be a sensor failure as opposed yes. to a failure of the thing that the sensor is measuring? I mean, you, you have to be simultaneously considering multiple failure modes and not assume that anything means what it appears to mean, but that everything is subject to error of observation, error of communication, error of interpretation. Absolutely. All right. Thank you for a great talk, Peter. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I realize I, I think we're at the end of our published time um, and I don't want to keep people here forever. I do see there's still a hand raised by uh, Sherry. Uh, do you want the, uh, the honor, if such it is, of, uh, of, of being the last one to you know, stick a spear in the bowl tonight? Yeah, I just was wanted to address the issue that you talked about, laws that um, probably are now obsolete or um, need to be looked at more carefully and i think that going forward we might want to look at have every law having a grandfather clause that is this law either expires in 10 years or five years or 100 years and then we look at it yeah. that 
Go ahead. It, it, those are often called sunset clauses, and they can be very effective. They can be also very dangerous. One of the proposals that's that's acquired a, a lot of controversy is whether, for example, Social Security should have a five-year sunset. And if you could try to imagine repassing Social Security, you know, right now, that would be hard. Social Security is another interesting example because the age of 65 was hard coded into that law at a time when reaching the age of 65 was a relatively unusual thing. And the idea that people would typically spend a quarter or a third of their lives being older than 65 years old was completely absent from any of the calculations being made at the time that law was created. If that number, but, but of course it's political suicide to try to change that number. If yeah. the number had instead been an algorithm that would every year be updated based on demographic data and the number would fluctuate, but not in a way that required the fingerprints of any one legislator on it, we would probably today have a, a system that is far more resilient at scale to the evolving you know, age distribution of our population because we, we, it would not be an act of political suicide to change the number, it would just happen automatically. And that is one of the things that needs to be done. As I said, we need to be bold um, evangelists for the reality of exponential change. And when someone is about to do something that's going to become anachronistic in, in five years, say, I'm sorry, the way you're proposing to do this will make itself irrelevant in five years. We need to encode the reality of expected change into this now so we don't have to have a horrible argument in five years about, about having to break it and start all over again. Right. Yes, I agree. If we conclude the evening on, you have to be prepared to have the conversation that says it's not an admission of error to say you need to encode the need to change. It's a it's a an acceptance of the burden of 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 anticipating and accommodating that that certainty of continued acceleration in almost everything we do. Yes, it's an interesting future that we have to look forward to. I'm counting on it. Well, thank you all very much. I, I wish you a very good evening. And one of these days we'll do this again in a room where we're all able to enjoy a meal together. Thanks so much for uh, spending the time with us tonight. Always a pleasure. Good night. Bye-bye. So we have uh, some other things coming up. That's okay. Neither could you. Uh... So next month, uh, we're going to actually have an in-person meeting. It's a joint meeting with uh, a couple other groups, uh, PMI and also uh, IMC. And uh, it's going to be in Culver City. Uh, we, you actually will have to pay for the dinner. Uh, we. We're keeping it to a reasonable price, but it's going to be a, a great opportunity for uh, networking and to hear our uh, uh, our annual event uh, with uh, three uh, chief technology officers, uh, uh, moderated by uh, Tony Carr. So that's coming up on October 24th, and then in November we have uh, another annual event, the uh, Cybersecurity Panel, and we'll have uh, four speakers, uh, moderated by. Uh, uh, Stan Stahl, uh, similar to what we had last year. And at this point, we're envisioning that's going to be a virtual event. So please join us on October 24th for an in-person event with a delicious Italian food and uh, some great speakers. So we're anticipating having uh, up to uh, 120 people. And then, of course, we'd like to get your feedback. So we have a survey. Uh, as we've had in prior months, if you please uh, respond to us, it takes like 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Uh, that gives us valuable feedback. And uh, if you can do it right away, that would give us uh, uh, better information, better quality information in, uh, in line with uh, Peter Coffey's theme. Mm -hmm.